it's great to be here. I mean, to stand here because it's a very beautiful view. Um, so, is it just me, or you also sometimes wonder why you ever went to school? Have you ever imagined why some communities are amazingly uh, innovative and using technology very effectively, and some communities are not? Have you ever been confused about technology, or have you heard someone say that? I did. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a conference. It was called uh, Mobile for Human Development. And then there is like one great guy, he's from the ministry, he's been serving this country for many, many long time. And uh, it's really stuck in me. He said, we're very confused about technology. Why this happens? Why so many people confused about technology? When I was a kid, I always wonder what I learned, where, and how I'm gonna apply it. Now I grow up, I don't know, if close friends actually really agree on that, um, but I grow up and I become a techie. Um, so today, I'm gonna tell you about my work. My work is about um, local innovations. It's about fostering the local innovations. And my topic today um, is about a deeper understanding of the context to innovate and make the technology work. For this, I'm gonna give you two examples. The examples have been working for a long time. Over 250 million kids worldwide, they don't have access to school, which means they don't have a school near them. And nearly 800 million adults they don't know how to read and write. Um, when people think about schools, they think about like this very functional school, all the libraries are full of books, the teachers are like super smart, everything is working, and then it actually gives a sense of why the kid went to school. It's always the school normally should answer why the, ki the kid has to wake up in the morning and go. But in reality, Schools are like this, they are overcrowded. They never really answer why usually the kids are going to school. And they are not functional, they don't have enough resources. They don't really foster creativity like the video you heard before. In most cases, it's not working. I can give you examples. In Ethiopia, there was a study that one out of two children, one out of two children, are still illiterate after attending a school for three years. They don't have a basic understanding of to read and write, sitting eight hours a day and learn nothing. So this is the assumption what we had from the Global Literacy Project. And then we're asking ourselves what, what technology can do for this. So it's always great actually to start a project with imaginations. Um, so, and we, we went uh, to the idea that if we provide technology, a simple technology, and if we give this technology to the kids, maybe they can teach themselves. This was a previous assumption. So um, we went to uh, the most remote places in Ethiopia. Uh, it's called Wenche and Walenchete, um, and then we just, describe the community what's actually the benefit of the, the technology. So I remember actually, the first time when we go down with my colleague to the Wallenchete, which is 146 kilometers from Addis, all the community actually come to see us, of course. Like we're strangers, we're dressing differently, probably we don't look smart, um, and we're, we are invading their privacy, and, and everyone is coming, all the children, all the elders. And we explained to them, we have something amazing. It's gonna change your children's life. If you tell you exactly how it works, probably you'll not understand because we're looking for these spaces where there's no infrastructure and there is no, any nearest school is actually very far. So they don't really have access. It's not just only the kids, but also the adults don't have access to um, schools or any kind of education. 
And after a lot of orientation uh, to the community, because everybody has interest in education, you heard that also before, um, so they agreed that we actually implement this project in these places. Um, I also remember the first day when we came to drop those tablets to the hands of the kids. Some of the kids are very shy. Like Burtukan, you see her on the, on, on the screen. Burtukan is one, this little shy girl sitting on the corner and then just accepting her tablet and carrying it. And all the kids actually react the same way. They don't know what it is. Of course, they probably think that it's just a toy. And the first assumption I had was that they would probably dig the hole and then bury it. I mean, you know, or just throw, throw each other, just like the other kids. Um, and then when you just give them, like you see these kind of bright faces and imagining what they could do with this. No, we didn't even give them any instruction. We don't tell them like where the power button is or what does it do. And then Burtukan was the first kid who knew where the power button is. And then she figured out that in less than 10 minutes. This is in one entity site. In one entity site also there are like other kids who figure out even faster. Um, so after we dropped those tablets and we left, We don't know how actually how they react to it. We didn't tell them that, don't give them any kind of instructions. And we come back after a week. Mind you, we had a software tracking, which tracks what's happening there. So it's not completely blind, you know? When you collect the data, we know how, how they spend the time. So it was very, very profound. The profound part of the project is that the kids actually are spending much, much more time on the tablet and then they learn something out of it. They're not just playing with it, or they didn't actually throw it around, but they used it. So when we come back in one week, actually they already know how to swap around and zoom it and then take a picture, you know, all these kind of technological things. Kids are amazing. And I thought, oh, I mean, I'm a techie and then I probably created 40 techies in this country. <laughs> but the reality is, they are not really focusing on the technology. They are focusing on the content. So when you see a TV, you don't see a TV. You see the broadcasting. You don't really usually care about how the TV works. You just really care how the content is, and then you just see people inside. So the kids are digital natives. They are like that. They really don't talk about technology like we always do. They don't talk about like these fancy things. They really use it. They really understand what it is. So today, probably heard about this project like before, but today like I'm gonna share you like some amazing um, discoveries what we had. We, which I call it the equation. We used applications from the shelf, which means these applications are available for everyone. Everyone in Western countries, in Eastern countries, in Ethiopia. So we equip all the tablet with games, movies, music, you know, all the things like you can find on the internet. And in the application, we teach them what animal is so that actually they understand and then trying to figure out the complexity of the language and we put octopus and donkey and ice cream and all this kind of stuff on the tablet. I don't know how many of you know octopus or how many of you saw octopus in your life. Like we're living in a landlocked country. Um, I haven't heard it very recently. And they don't really have any idea what ice cream is. They don't have any association with that. But they have with a donkey. Donkeys are something very personal. They know how they breathe. They live with them, they touch them. It's very contextual. It's something they're really absolutely familiar with. So of course they learn about donkey much faster than any other thing. So we ask them to take a picture of their surroundings so that actually we include into the tablet. And they start to take a picture of what they see, what they feel, what they interact with. And then we integrated that into their applications. And I remember that first week when I came, they just go around, but the moment when they see what they took, what they did themselves, they pause, they just want to show it to the other kids. Because that's their creation, that's something they profoundly understand. This is something amazing discovery, it's, it's gonna be, it's, maybe it's a very simple, simple discovery, but it's very profound when it comes to use of technology, when it comes to making sense of like many activities what we do in the communities. This is about, a deeper understanding of the context you are working with so that you 
can be innovative. So this is the backbone of innovation. No one can invent a medicine unless first understand what kind of plants are growing in its location. No one ever creates a system without first know what's happening in its, in its village, in its surroundings. The difference between communities who are innovative and who are not is that the one who knows, they know exactly what's going on in their surroundings. They know what's going on in their house. Um, the second example is, I'm gonna make it actually very shorter, I know I'm running out of time. It's a creation about the innovation space in Ethiopia. So in most cases, like great startups, I could see actually a couple of you here. In the beginning, we usually know what we do, why we do it, and in Ethiopia, there is like one missing link. We don't know where to go. So if you have a great idea in Ethiopia, where do you go? Where do you start? The question is very simple, but the answer is very complicated because for innovation to, to come into action and then for people to really start their own businesses, first they need to understand how that works, where the money comes from, where are the mentors, you know? Um, so we just created this space for innovators to come. So our idea to create ISARDIS was that we assume this is just another community. This is just another very innovative country. The reason why they are not innovative is just not because there are not innovative minds around. It's just they don't know, there is no space for that. There is no space to enable people to be innovative. So the space is actually created for the people who have crazy ideas and if they want to implement that crazy ideas into reality. And then that's a place to be imaginative place where people are actually free to imagine. So we had, um, a lot of activities there. We have like bar camps, boot camps, we have like different activities, you know, kind of free people to think really freely and then we have mentors, of, network of mentors who are helping them, you know, like to understand the stuff. And then what we see is people always, always interested to solve the problem what they see. They're always looking for a local solution. They always look for a social businesses. This is very profound. And how we use technology right now, we are trying to solve our problems with the tools, what we use right now is like trying to solve our, uh, the solutions what we have from the problem somewhere else. If the system is created by the problem of someone else, the chance that it's gonna work without understanding of the deeper context is very, very minimal. At the same time, when people actually always talk about localization, they just think about changing the language from English to Amharic or when they think about customization, you know, they just change something. But it needs a very deeper understanding of the context for technology to work. I asked Burtukan what her favorite word is, and she says donkey. Well, no surprise. And I also asked her what she wanna be when she grow up. It's a very classical question, usually adults ask kids. And she said she wanna be a government employee I don't know how many of you actually want to be that, <laughs> especially with Tepian context. But there is a very simple reason for that. Why she doesn't say that she want to be a doctor or a pilot, because she just doesn't know them. She knows this guy who always come and visit them, proper dressed guy, smart, and that she knows, and he's working for the government. Of course she wants to be him, that she knows. This is something we need to understand when you create projects. So the, the whole um, innovation hub space is not just limited only for Ethiopia. This is actually like a movement. So it's happening all over Africa. It's more than hundreds of labs like us, I said, this is like mushrooming in all over Africa, fostering the local innovation to work. Um, so I'm gonna leave you um, with one thing. I told you about this hyper-local learning solutions, and hyper-local use of technologies. And unless we have this kind of very comprehensive study of our local situation, we cannot be innovative. And that's the difference between innovative communities and non-innovative communities. Burtukan, maybe she's not an expert in octopus, 
or maybe she's not expert on ice cream, but she's expert on donkeys, which is a great thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>